Great, wonderful. Hi, Ralph. Hi, Bill. Thanks so much for making time. Um, real pleasure to sp spend some time with you talking about um, the community of positive mavericks you've both created. But before we go into that, I would like to hear a little bit more about both of your story. Maybe we um, start with Ralph. Um, Ralph, what, what was your journey to setting up R3.0? Because you, you've um, seen the big corporates from within in Siemens, I know that, and, and then also the Global Reporting Initiative. I think there's a real trajectory there, and I would love for you to, to, mm -hmm. to tell the story and also maybe particularly the insights or the shifts in perspective that triggered within you the need to move on and, and um, do the next thing. Yeah, sure. So thank you. Um, yeah, like I say very often, I start to call myself uh, um, an early veteran <laughs> in the field of sustainability. Mm -hmm. I've started to really um, look at that paradigm of sustainable development really since the 1987 Brundtland report. And I was then studying economics at the University of Nuremberg from 1988 to 1992. And then in 1992, the first Rio conference happened. So my economic studies were actually really surrounded by the first two major global events mm -hmm. around sustainable development. And uh, the first one has influenced me in a way that I was thinking, okay, so if you're now going to study economics, economics, micro and macroeconomics, because that's, that's the way you had to study it uh, at that time, you were not choosing between either or, you had to do both. Uh, which I find very healthy and good. Um, there was the idea, okay, I was very attracted by the Brundtland report, by the paradigm of sustainable development. So how does economic theory make a contribution to that? And that was the start of a, of a journey uh, and, a, and really something and searching. And this searching to a certain degree still continues now more than 30 years after that. Um, and I was also the first in, in Germany, as far as I know, or maybe internationally, that wrote, how can you, uh, that wrote a thesis about how can you integrate sustainable development into accounting. Mm -hmm. It was really the very early days um, where nobody was really taking care about those things. Uh, it was still the age of abundance, um, um, as, many, as many call it. Um, but I was very triggered by the idea of people, planet and prosperity because that's what it was originally. We have just reduced it to people, planet and profit to make it better fit to the corporate world and to quarterly reporting and uh, all of those technicalities. And what really interested me as well, which then is a real challenge for economic theory, um, how do you take care about intergenerational equity or intra and intergenerational equity? How do you take care that whatever you do doesn't influence or reduce the, the opportunities for future generations to have the same opportunities than your own generation? So <clears throat> those, those two things uh, really I have very much in my mind as I now look at what uh, sustainable development or sustainability or the term sustainability has become. And I often think, oh, it has become sort of a comic version of what it originally was meant to be. But back to my, to my own path, um, I was then, after my studies, I started to work for Siemens, mm -hmm. first in a site in my hometown of Erlangen, because they were looking for somebody who could do uh, ecological aspects with economic understanding um, or deal with those uh, things. And very soon I was actually pro promoted to the headquarter level uh, in, in, in Munich and then had the chance to really travel worldwide because Siemens is such a global um, uh, company. They always say they feel at home in 190 countries of the planet. Um, well, and um, yeah, from that perspective, uh, this idea of sustainable development became very sort of visual for me uh, or the non-existence of, sustainable, uh, of sustainability became really uh, clear to me because I've seen many of the shitholes on this planet during, during these travels. Um, which still sometimes, these are pictures that still sometimes hunt me today. Um, and during that time, I was then charged with developing a first sustainability strategy for a company like Siemens on a global scale. 
um, which means you talk to people all over the world with different cultural backgrounds, with different life stories, with different experiences. And when you try to do that, you need to, or you try to find vocabulary that you can use so that people understand what you're talking about when you, when you talk about sustainability. And exactly at that time, I got in touch with um, sort of a, a group of people in Boston they were calling themselves the Global Reporting Initiative. They started in 1997 and in early 1998, I was having a first meeting with Alan White when he was in Germany for GRI for the first time. And we met at the uh, um, Federation of, of, of Chemical Industries in Frankfurt where I was a visitor. And um, I was early at that meeting and he was early. Uh, so we were the only two in the room um, and we started to talk and it was sort of like a direct click and really sort of mesmerizing to see how, how, that, how there was a, a direct connection between Alan and myself. Um, and, and, and since then, I, I have to say, I, I call him one of the two major mentors that I had mm. uh, in my business life. And, um, and so I, I, I worked as a European industry expert in the development of the first and partially the second generation of the GRI guidelines. Uh, and the second one came out in 2002 at the Johannesburg summit where I was um, attending. And um, right after that, GRI announced that they would move from Boston to Amsterdam mm -hmm. to open their headquarters there. And um, Alan asked me if I wanna join uh, GRI. And I was really sort of at the brink of having developed this first global strategy for Siemens, um, but also recognized that certain things weren't quite smooth mm. uh, during that time. You know, there was, for, for example, the idea that, um, you know, for anti-corruption, you need a, a whistleblower system. And I was just proposing a very rudimentary whistleblower system uh, to Siemens as, as one safeguard. Um, of, of anti-corruption measures. Um, I was advocating for uh, labor rights um, mm. and I felt resistance mm. exactly with the, these two points, um, really very heavy resistance. And I was at the point where I said, you know, you cannot introduce that strategy without these, these issues because mm. then it's really only patchwork. Mm. You really only do whatever you like and you find it nice and you can you can say something about it and it all looks good it's like it's like cherry picking mm. um and i and i said i'm i'm not ready for that you know it's either the full enchilada or not um and uh, it happened that i um sort of accidentally gave an interview to the uh, to the financial times during those days uh, the story that i'm also telling in my book mm. and um the uh, Alison maitland who was the reporter for Financial Times at that, at that, at that uh, time was, was asking me, so, so what's the GRI strategy of, of Siemens? And I said, well, you know, I'm working with, with GRI around um, these topics uh, as, an, as, a, as a European industry expert. And um, there might be a chance that uh, Siemens will publish a GRI based report someday. And uh, the next day after the, the interview was in, came out, I was, I was asked to order. Wow. Um, the head of communications at uh, Siemens called me or did let me, uh, or you know, my boss was told by the head of communication mm -hmm. that uh, I should not have given that interview. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, was it an interview? She called me and asked me a couple of questions. Uh, I had no idea that that would end up in, a, uh, in an article. She didn't even tell me, uh, so it did. And, uh, and there was, you know, the article was saying, you know, GRI will most likely publish a GRI-based sustainability Siemens report. Report, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, Siemens, Siemens would do that. Yeah, so I was, I was asked to order and in the same week, Alan asked me if I want to join GRI. <laughs> <laughs> I made you know, it easy. Karma, whatever, um, and I was at that point also knowing that other things are not that smooth uh, inside the company. So I, I decided to leave uh, Siemens mm -hmm. and join GRI, which, which I really understood to be a really important step in my career. Mm -hmm. uh, the, whole of, the whole enlightenment uh, that I found with these multi-stakeholder dialogues um, happening all around the world uh, with GRI 
the different cultural aspects and my ability to give something back, um, which I also started already during Siemens. It's a story that I'm not telling very often, but it is that um, whenever I had a chance to travel, I always uh, thought, um, can I add a couple of days to that trip and most likely a weekend or something, mm -hmm. which had the very wonderful benefit that, that, that flights became cheaper for my, for my employer. And I had a couple of extra days. And knowing that I had such a big footprint, I always had the idea I want to give something back. So I, I try to connect with local NGOs uh, during those trips and mostly actually ended up with, uh, um, with uh, Medicines uh, Without Borders or what do you call them? Doctors Without Borders. Mm -hmm. um, and that is why I very directly seen some of those sustainability issues firsthand if it was, you know, um, curing the fingers of little kids on a dump, um, mm. trying to get out stuff uh, from, from the waste, um, burning things uh, out of platines and things like that. Um, so Doctors Without Borders had these um, um, uh, rolling hospitals, um, which, they, which they used. Or during the time uh, around HIV AIDS in South Africa, I was with, with Doctors Without Borders and they had various um, sort of stations where they, um, where they had little kids um, that got AIDS from their parents. Both parents already dead. And um, I, was, I was going there and I was saying, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a, a, a medicine. I, I don't know what I can do. And um, they said, you know, every day we have two or three kids that will die. At the, at the very same day. And we don't have time to, to take care of them. Um, the only thing that you can, or what you can actually do, just keep them in your arms. Just give them a hand, hold, hold their hand wow. until they take their very last breath. And that was my, my first own encounter with death, mm -hmm. wow. I have to say. So these, these, these things are really are a big motivation for me doing what I do. And uh, so GRI went on, the second generation of the GRI guidelines came out, third generation came out. And in both of these generations, I was responsible for the principles work stream. G2 had, had the principles work stream or the principles in there for the very first time. And G3 uh, then for the second time. And both times we were at, the, at G2, we were trying to embed these principles really from the perspective, let there be principles. Huh? And um, we came up with, with a set of principles. Um, and in G3, um, the idea was really, how are they all connected in a, in a process so that people understand that GRI is not just a list of indicators and a tick off box exercise. It is really something where there is a real, a real thought process in there. And that if you want to be sure about what's material to you, you need to know your sustainability context and you need to be in touch with your stakeholders. So stakeholder inclusiveness and sustainability context surround the idea of materiality. And then there's completeness from the perspective of the responsibility of a board um, to make sure that really everything that is of real importance has been discussed in this process. So it's more an oversight process of the board and also ensures uh, involvement of the board. So um, that was very much to my heart because without sustainability context, the whole GRI guidelines are meaningless. Mm. They don't say anything about sustainability if you don't connect it to the sustainability context. Um, and from that onwards, um, that was really the focus um, also of my part of my work of my, with GRI. Um, and, and I didn't see that that principle of sustainability context was used uh, neither was it enforced uh, by GRI, and um, to a certain degree, it was not even discussable, mm. uh, even not, not even during, during some of the board meetings that I was able to attend. Um, and that led me to leave GRI uh, in 2008, apart from a couple of other reasons, um, mm. more personal reasons um, that also surrounded that, that time of my life. And... Um, during that time, or in the last years at GRI, I was also the, the contact person to the major accounting firms and to the to the big um, consulting firms. And ah, so I was the link to the Deloitte. 
that was yeah. that that was the link then to Deloitte. I was mm-hmm. I was talking to most of the CEOs of these organizations, and I was thinking, man, if you if you would understand what sustainability really means. And not just another service line or just assurance or limited assurance of a of a sustainability report. You could have so much impact mm-hmm. with your clients. So I was talking to all these CEOs and 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 I was looking for a company that that at least had that ambition. And I and I truly felt that most at that time uh, in Deloitte, where the CEO. Uh, Roger Dassen, who was also uh, dealing with the whole EMEA region, really got that uh, uh, that understanding. And I still remember when we we were talking, I, I I told him I think three things. The first one was, if you are consulting sustainability or on sustainability, well, you need to practice what you preach. If you assure sustainability reports, you need to have one yourself, and it has to be externally verified or uh, assured. And you know you cannot do that yourself because you know that's a conflict of interest. So you need to ask one of your main competitors to do that. Mm-hmm. So that was like mm-hmm. slick, <laughs> okay, understood. Uh, second thing that I said was, you know, I, I don't want to set this up as another service line. Sustainability is cross-cutting. It is. It doesn't matter if it's consulting or um, auditing or it is. Um, um, consulting or it is financial advisory or tax advisory sustainability happens everywhere so what i want is an approach where all of these parts of the firm understand what their contribution to sustainability is which none of the other firms did at that time and he said well okay you know you're definitely choosing uh, the more difficult path because in the end when you look at, uh, at a con- conglomerate like deloitte but it's the same with all the other big big four it's not one major firm, it's mm-hmm. 120 little firms mm-hmm. uh, with a partner and a director and a couple of senior managers and managers and young consultants. Mm. And in the end, they are competing mm. uh, for the budget that a client might have, um, apart from what is legally necessary anyway. And I said, I, I want sustainability to be in any of these. Um, yeah, and like I said, he said, you know, you're you're choosing the most difficult path, <laughs> I think. And then the third thing that I said was, <clears throat> you know what? I don't want to become a partner. And then he was really astonished because that's <laughs> nobody has said that to me so far. They all want to become a partner in the end, isn't that why you why you join these firms? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you know, if I if I take sustainability serious. Um, I need to have a critical distance to the organization. And that means that I cannot be part of the ownership group. Mm. And he said, well, okay, your choice. <laughs> and then I, then I started to work for Deloitte um, the first three years really to bring them up to speed around sustainability, um, getting them into sustainability reporting, uh, came up with uh, a re- report that was then under limited assurance first and uh, assured by, by uh, Ernst & Young. Um, at that time. And then after the first two, we stepped over to reasonable assurance, which is much more difficult uh, because then you really have to prove more or less every single word uh, in the report Mm -hmm. that that is true what you say and you need to prove it in some way. And then the report sort of changes a little bit in the way that you write these three reports because you need to prove what you say. Um, So not much greenwashing opportunity really in there. and uh, so I did that. And then the last two years in Deloitte, I was really more focusing on trying to make a connection between um, sustainability and innovation. Mm-hmm. And one of the first projects that uh, we did together with TNT and Peter Bucker, who's now with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, was still the CEO uh, um, of TNT, um, was, was quite excited about an idea that we had around creating a serious game. Uh, for boards so that they better understand what the impact of their decisions is on sustainability Uh, and then in consequence on economic performance as well Mm -hmm. so we developed that together with with uh, with tnt as the pilot client Um, it went live um, very exciting Um, and then we had the 20 what was it 2013 conference or 20 or so conference uh, and I had a workshop where I presented the, the game and there was this guy called Bill Bowie 
who actually attended that session and had a lot of critical questions because he was with Harvard, I think, uh, at that time and was really delving into that whole uh, data uh, related stuff and um, yeah so so he was he was really doing a major test of of the game uh, there we we played it together during that session yeah and, i think yeah. The, i think that was the first time that we met in person uh, yes right we'd, we'd known each other before then um, yeah that was a, that was that was the first uh, uh actual meeting and i think that was at the the global reporting initiative conference in in 2012 or 2013 well, yeah no no exactly. 2010 2010 i'm sorry was it 2010 oh. i think it was 2012 or so <laughs> something like that yeah because, uh, what, because what was the point that that both of you then decided okay I, well, we actually need to set up something separate that, that led like um to reporting 3.0 at the time but i think at that time um i was just about to leave deloitte mm -hmm. because the uh, 2012 was the the rio plus 20 conference mm -hmm. um, so it must have been 2012 bill <laughs> and um, uh, I looked at that outcome document called The Future We Want, mm -hmm. and it was defining the idea of a green, inclusive and open economy, so to say. We now call it a regenerative and distributive economy, but um, the, the early wording, <clears throat> well, the government wording was green, inclusive and open economy. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at that and um, uh, we were thinking, well, will we get there? And how will do that job to get there? Um, we looked at the existing standards. We looked at management system standards. We looked at benchmarks, rating, rankings, indices, um, the typical COSO approach around risk management. And we thought none of that is going to get us there. So how are we going to make space for what's really necessary to get us there and not just that sort of current and still today that current motivation of steps in the right direction incremental improvement politically opportune stuff because i already knew at that time it, it needs more than that with the remaining time because i was uh, since limits to growth i was always very aware about um, the sort of various development streams and you know, how, how data was showing us we're running against the wall. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I, was, I was always a good friend with Peter Teuscher from BSR Consulting, uh, BSD Consulting, sorry, um, in Switzerland. And there was always the idea that someday we would do something together. So um, I got in touch with, um, uh, with Peter and said, here's, here's an opportunity. Um, and Peter was excited and he said, let's, let's start something. Mm -hmm. Let's see whatever it will be and uh, what it will become. So we were working around a first sort of structure for an event, of the, the, the first at that time reporting 3.0 conference. So we started to call it reporting 3.0 from early 2013 onwards, mm -hmm. building a community. It was not legally um, uh, captured, but um, um, organizing a first conference at the Heinrich Böll Stiftung in Berlin, mm -hmm. um, who supported uh, the event, and we had a full house. So around 250 people or so. Or so. It, it was the first and the last uh, conference where we talked in German, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> had quite a good, uh, good, good, good panels, good structure, and it was really the idea: is there enough appetite for? doing something together that really captures what is necessary. And there seemed to be this appetite. So we, so we worked on words. Um, it began sort of soul searching of what sort of structure do we need? What sort of work rhythm do we need? What sort of legal entity would we need to be? And uh, then we had two more conferences in Berlin at the Microsoft Accelerator mm -hmm. um, where we really try to get us toward that, that necessary structure. Uh, we had great keynote speakers there. Um, we had John Elkington, for example, and uh, John Fullerton was speaking there and, and so on. Um, and um, by the time of 2015, we then decided, okay, so we need this work ecosystem. We need 
products that need to be um, global public goods. So they need to be um, free of charge and available for everyone around the world. Mm -hmm. They need to be sort of crowdsourced uh, by expertise from around the world. And uh, they need to be funded um, by, because I, was, I, I had left Deloitte at that time. Um, I was um, helped by BUSD Consulting um, to sort of develop reporting 3.0 into something that can sort of, sort of self-sustain from a certain moment onwards. Uh, and it took us until 2015 to really get to that point. And by the time 2015, um, Bill actually um, uh, was, was speaking at the conference. He, together with UNEP, had worked on raising the bar, mm -hmm. a very important sort of document uh, that really defines what needs to happen around thresholds and allocations and around really a governing structure um, to really get that um, established. Um, and at that time, we were deciding that, that Bill would actually join us. And since 2015, he's on the board uh, as a senior director of R3.0. And um, we have since then together developed that work ecosystem now consisting of in total nine blueprints, seven of them already developed and one currently under development and one more to be developed. Um, and the way that that sort of organically um, started to exist was that we first looked at what is this, this in, uh, uh, um, green, inclusive and open economy as it was called at that time. And we were both charmed by the idea of backcasting from an ideal. Mm. Um, like the natural step has uh, had developed that methodology uh, and I'm sure there were others before, but this is the first time where I learned about backcasting. And so we developed this idea, what is this, this green inclusive and open economy? And then move backwards to where we are right now and look at what the gaps are and then develop sort of what's necessary to leapfrog towards that ideal. And we were looking at the, at the skeleton of what topic areas are important. And it really led to, of course, re reporting because we were still called reporting 3.0 at that time. Um, accounting, how would accounting look if it supports reporting that supports the idea uh, of a green inclusive and open economy? What would data, uh, how would data architecture look uh, to support uh, what's necessary uh, in, uh, from the data perspective. And then, and then Bill and others also brought in the idea, but all of that would culminate in a redesign of business models. Mm -hmm. So we took that on board and said, okay, so this, these are the four sort of edges, um, stilts that we ran into the ground to build our house on. Mm -hmm. um, so these were the first four blueprints that we developed and then people uh, then came to us and said, how are we now going to implement that? Mm -hmm. And that is where we realized we're starting to talk about transformation here mm -hmm. um, because these are uh, uh, quite drastic changes that need to happen in organizations if they wanna really fulfill the, need, uh, uh, yeah, the needs or what's necessary mm -hmm. uh, and not just do incremental stuff. And um, from that, from that yeah, moment onward, um, we were thinking we need another blueprint and we call it the transformation journey blue, blueprint or which, which then gave birth to the transformation journey programs because people also said, now that you have this blueprint, can you, can you educate us around that? Mm -hmm. can, can, we, can we, you know, you know in, in, can you help us implement? Um, and that, is, that was sort of another organic step in our development at R3.0 um, that this sort of generic uh, education uh, became part of our portfolio. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, we were more and more convinced that there are four more areas that need more deepening. Uh, the first two that we developed was um, an idea about what is sustainable finance really and not what it is right now. Again, sort of a comic version of what's actually needed. Um, and then as always, you know, you look at what's the ideal, you backcast to where are those 18 different types of 
of financial market players at this moment? And what, what, what recommendations can we give them to move or to notch up towards that ideal? And at that time, there was also a lot of discussion around um, the idea of value. So what, what is really of value in a, we then called it regenerative and distributive economy. And there was the buzzword or, or the buzz around the circular economy. And we combined those two topics into one more blueprint, which you call value cycles. So really the idea of in a regenerative and distributive economy, what is of value? And how can you measure that towards what we then call system value? Because, you know, not build value on the back or not build capital on the back of other capital. So context-based multi-capitalism is a, is a major ingredient to actually come to that point. And then the idea around uh, the circular economy, um, we looked at that and, and, and when you look at nature, you find that processes are partially linear, partially circular, partially cyclical and partially fract uh, um, spiral. So altogether we call that fractal. Um, if you look at the life cycle of a, of a tree, you have all of these components in there. Um, so the point that we wanted to make was a circular economy is not the end goal. It is part of a solution, but it's not the solution. And I was especially triggered around that because the country where I live in here in the Netherlands, they, they are uh, saying, we want to be the first circular economy by 2050. And the question to me was always, yeah, but will that be sustainable? You know, can you answer that, that question? And the answer is no, they can't because they don't know. So necessary clarifications in the value cyclist blueprint. And then the last two topics, which are of overarching importance, I think, and we see that right now, um, already sort of bubbling up, is the idea of educational transformation. That is a blueprint that we're working on right now with Anna Lou Smitsman as the, as the lead author and a incredible working group, I have to say, um, that we have been able to collect. Um, we're in the middle of the process and we already see what's bubbling up and uh, what a leapfrog that will be. Uh, and it will, you know, if it's, if it's recognized, it will shake up um, the idea around education and educational transformation. Um, very evolutionary. And uh, so from that perspective, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, project to be in right now. And the last one that we're going to develop is around, um, um, and now the title always comes back because we changed the title like three times, funding for systemic governance or something like that. <laughs> and I think I got it right this time. Um, it's really the idea around um, how can we, how can we get a grip on what's systemically needed to fund the necessary governance around all of what we're doing here. Uh, because we're talking to, to foundations and, and, and we see how stuck they are. We talk to multilateral organizations, they, they have problems understanding. Mm -hmm. Governments do things that are more of short term, or they wait until uh, a court sues them to do something, or the kids on the streets uh, get more powerful instead of really thinking systemically what's, the, what's necessary and needed. So that's, that's the whole enchilada around that as a how it all started from, from the Brundtland report up until this day, and we'll continue from there. And, and so. pa patient Bill sat through all of that and probably knows the story inside out. Um, now this, 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 this was really, really interesting to have this, this large arc of how, how this all evolved. I mean, what, what it makes me want to reflect on is, is the role that I from see reporting 3.0 and then R3.0 have played so like when, when I listen to what you built and how you built it, there's, there's, there's both in terms of your personal trajectory route, there, there's a lot of systemic rank within the old system that you brought in having worked with Siemens and GRI was still very much system central. It's not in any way alternative. And then... Um, Somehow, what I find interesting, and for me, this is around the time that Bill came in around the 2014, 15, when I listened to your, your timeline, um, what you dared to do, having built a pretty kind of what gets measured gets managed, let's call it reporting 3.0 and all the kind of conventional, like that the whole structure, like even the backcasting is completely conventional for corporate 
consultancy, like the, the conventionality of Deloitte and McKinsey and, and, and all those players. But what, what you've done is that at some point you open up the envelope to allow influences very different to that chorus. Mm. And this positive maverick idea of, of still bringing the, the conventional players together, but, but actually like, for example, what you did for me, like relatively early on when my book was still relatively new, inviting me and it took a year for me to say yes for various reasons, but um, it, it gave me an audience that at that point I didn't have. And I think you've done that for other people too, but in doing so, you've actually catalyzed a really fruitful dialogue. And I would love to um, maybe a little, little shorter, give Bill, Bill an opportunity to tell your story, how you came into all of this and, and your background. But, but what I'd want us all to come back to, which I would find really interesting to have a conversation around is actually this framing around age of abundance and age of scarcity and allocations and all of that, because um, I have a slightly nuanced, um, like I, I see a potential danger of that framing as you're doing it. But if, before we go there, um, Bill, how, how did you make you, I mean, I, I mean you, you've straddled being in the alternative and the conventional camp for most of your professional career working with the UN, but also living in an eco-village and all those kind of things. And um, tell me a bit more about your story. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and I think that is sort of a good intersection point um, to the R3.0 world. So, uh, you know, just going back in, in time, I came into the field of sustainability uh, totally by accident. So I, you know, my, my uh, uh, graduate studies were all in um, writing primarily, rhetoric and, and composition um, and literature studies. So I was um, uh, really focused on, on writing and I, I just by chance ended up getting a gig writing about socially responsible investing um, right around the same time period that, that Ralph was mentioning, you know, the, the late 1990s, uh, early 2000s. Um, and, and really for me, it was, just, you know, I had written other, in other realms, I had been teaching at the college and high school level uh, about writing. Um, and so for me, it was just, it was just a, an, a, a, another area of, of interest until, you know, I was writing for socialfunds.com uh, for a couple of years. And at that point, I was like, oh, I actually know a fair amount about this field from having written four articles a week, every week. Um, and it was, you know, after doing that for, for, say, two, three, four years, I started being asked um, to write not just from a journalistic perspective about the field, but also sort of write uh, uh, as, a, as sort of as a member of the field. And that really culminated, uh, I would say, in 2007, uh, when I was asked to be the writer of the first ever sustainability report for Walmart. And so that was sort of going into the belly of the beast. And that, there was a decision point at that, at that moment of, do I um, collaborate with this organization, Walmart, that I was actually pretty vehemently against? I, I, so, while I was writing that report, I also attended a protest uh, at, a, at a Walmart uh, uh, store. Um, so uh, I was certainly you know, working on both sides of the line, as you might say, or, or, or an inside outside approach. Um, but I decided that it, 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 it was, and this bears in on, on your question about sort of the, the, the conventionality. Um, you know, at that point, I think that there was a consciousness or a, a line of thinking, a, a, a hypothesis in the field that actually business is the largest impactor in the world and therefore changing things from inside of business um, would have more influence than trying to change it from the outside. And so, you know, this is a hypothesis that, that my personal experience Sort of exemplified of okay, I will I will sort of hold my nose and, and go into the belly of the beast at, at Walmart, um, and and try to make change there. Um, 
and I, I'd say that that line of, of, uh, of approach uh, lasted for, for quite a while. So I think the, the other major um, markers of, of my career, it sort of uh, went in two primary directions. So one direction we hit on earlier um, in about 2009 or so, I believe, uh, um, uh, Carolyn Reese, who had been the uh, sort of the primary architect of what became the uh, United Nations Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. So she had been the one who had conceived of this as a, as a British diplomat and then had connected with John Ruggie uh, at Harvard uh, to, to see this forward. So they at, at Harvard, um, she, she joined Harvard with, uh, with Ruggie and uh, Jay Nelson and, and, and others at the uh, Kennedy School. Uh, and they decided that they wanted to, to focus on the role of uh, interactive technology, as they were calling it at that time, or Web 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, and they wanted to look at whether Web 2.0 could have an influence on corporate accountability. So that's a, a research fellowship that they tapped me for. And that's part of that project that, that I um, interacted with Ralph uh, at, uh, on the serious gaming front, because serious gaming was one of the elements that we focused on. Uh, another element was uh, 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 virtual stakeholder engagement. So engaging stakeholders, not just in person, but also using um, interactive technologies to do so. Uh, and so I included that in the report that I co-authored with Marcy Merningham. Um, and when that came out in 2010, uh, I was actually <laughs> contacted by a, 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 an entrepreneur, Tom O'Malley, who was starting up a, a, a business that was doing just this. And so um, I actually worked with him uh, to build what's now called Current, C-U-R-R-N-T, which is a, you know, an online stakeholder engagement platform that has uh, been around for about 10 years at this point in various different uh, iterations. Um, and we at R3.0 use it uh, regularly for our en engagements. Um, but that was sort of one aspect of my career. The, the, the aspect that's really most relevant to, to my work at R3.0 and to this conversation um, is, uh, uh, Ralph mentioned earlier, the, 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 the principle of sustainability context. Um, and that was one that really drew my attention early on, I think as early as 2004. So a couple of years after the principle had been articulated, I was writing about it. And in particular, you know, writing that I wasn't seeing it be, being implemented. You know, here was this beautiful principle which said that the sustainability of an organization um, can't be measured outside of the, the larger context of sustainability at the systemic level. So ecological, social, economic sustainability um, uh, of an organization is, is only really relevant if the larger system uh, mm -hmm. is, is also sustainable. Um, and uh, so this is an area where uh, not seeing that for a number of years, I started to engage directly with the Global Reporting Initiative and asking them, so again, using this sort of inside approach you know, can we make change from the inside or do we have to have um, uh, advocacy from the outside as well? So I was using sort of outside advocacy to try and get the global reporting initiative to, to up its game on uh, sustainability context. I, I uh, ended up starting a, 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 a network, the sustainability context group in 2012 with uh, Mark McElroy, uh, a colleague who's uh, founded the Center for Sustainable Organizations and really has done more to, to promote uh, uh, thresholds and allocations or- Close or students of the Mella Meadows, no? Was yeah, so he, a, yeah, so he was, this, this line around sustainability context, you know, although it developed at the Global Reporting Initiative as an articulation, um, Mark's work on it does uh, go back to his collaboration with uh, Dana uh, who, as I'm sure your listeners know, was, a, was the, the lead author of the 1972 Limits to Growth um, report. Mm -hmm. uh, and she went on to have a career at, at, at Dartmouth University as a, as a professor, but also launched a, a sustainability institute um, in the 90s. And so Mark was the chair of that institute 
uh, throughout the late 90s and all the way until 2002 when she passed away prematurely. And when that was happening, you know, Mark and, and Dana were in conversation around how do you apply sustainability indicators at an organizational level? And that was really sort of her next frontier, if you will. And so when she passed away, Mark had already really been focusing on that. So it really kind of um, coincided with the, with the Global Reporting Initiative articulating that connection. Um, so, you know, um, suffice it to say that, that really this, this um, focus on thresholds and allocation. So, you know, what is a sustainability threshold? What's the, the limit of an impact that you can have on a resource? And that, that resource is still available to, to, for humans and, and other living beings to use to support their well-being, to support their ongoing living, um, and and what's you know when when we cross that line, that threshold, you know how far do we have? How much buffer zone do we have until there's actually a systemic tipping point where the the, the system of that resource regeneration um, uh, uh, phase shifts. Uh, and is no longer in um, the but same sort of systemic the, uh, status. Let me, let me ask you something about that, because like on, on the one hand, it, like um, just to be really clear about that, that was meant as a compliment, the whole conventionality thing earlier, because um, it was such vital and important work to f really build a very strong foundation of that side of a bridge that, that, right. that we need to, to build. And... Um, the the question that I sometimes I always ask, even like also with my own ideas, with all ideas, is what's what's the unintended shadow side of framing the issue in this particular way? And and what, one thing that I still don't sit comfortably with around the whole notion of um, like even that it is indirectly blaming overpopulation and um, that it's all about that too many of us and there's not enough resources and the more of us, the quicker we erode the resource base, the, the, the less resources there will be. And, and so now we need a system to allocate the, the scarcity that is left. Um, part of that is like even the framing that the limits to growth report um, kicked into being the whole conversation of the Club of Rome of the global problematique. What, mm -hmm. what I've begun to learn, like I maybe I was indoctrinated um, in it from the Schumacher College side with the kind of smallest, beautiful and built from the grassroots, but also learning from my biological background as, as a biologist and an evolutionary scientist. Um, and then looking at the complexity background that, that, that I also learned at, at Chumaha College, increasingly the, the questions that working regeneratively brings up is, um, does it serve to start from a global problematic? Because when you go to a global problematic, you, you're immediately framing everything, all the issues as problems. Um, and in order to make them global, you have to abstract them. So energy, climate change, transport, um, all, all material culture, um, impact of industry, social inequality, um, all of that. Th these problems all need addressing. and They need addressing in a holistic and integrative way. But we're still looking at them through the abstractive lens of here's the same pattern that we see globally and we need to solve it everywhere. But when you look at it more locally, place-based or bioregionally ecosystem-based, then you can speak to the potential of that particular place to meet the needs of the people who live in that place. And it's a very different shift. And it's, it's similarly, like when we talk about limits, we bring in the second law of thermodynamics, which is a law of physics. And the timescales of physics are hundreds or thousands of millions of years. The timescale of life is much shorter. So when we speak about a new economics built on living principles and life, we need to reduce the time scale. And then suddenly there's this strange occurrence in a universe marching towards maximum entropy, which is that in localized place sourced 
locations like a planet as beautiful as this blue marble that we're whizzing through space in, life as a planetary colonizing process creates conditions conducive to life. Another way, it creates neg entropy, syntropy. It pushes against the force of entropy. And I think that the story we need to build is not a story of, oh, that was the age of, of abundance and now we're in the age of scarcity and how do we create th thresholds and limits? Yes, we need the language because we need to build the bridge. But for me, the more powerful framing is how do we globally collaborate and keep global trade and necessary resource extraction for certain type of technologies going at a level that enable us to radically re-regionalize. And I know you're both in agreement with the bioregional approach, but I see that in the bioregional approach, there is something that isn't about scarcity. It's about generating shared abundance. And yeah, I, how do you sit with with that? Like, I'm, I'm putting it as friends in the work. I'm putting it out as a as a challenge, just so we can play with that juicy question. Yeah, I mean, I I actually don't. I, I personally don't use the the term scarcity, I, mm -hmm. and that's you know that's a, a phrase that that Ralph has been using. And this is actually an an, an instance where you know Ralph and I see eye to eye on probably ninety ninety nine percent of of things, but. I just don't use that language um, in part, like I'm, I'm reading a book right now called The Limits of Scarcity, mm -hmm. um, which is, is, is actually sort of making the point that we don't actually, scarcity is a, um, scarcity is, is a human invention in some ways. So, so right now, if we look at the amount of um, resources that we have, there actually are enough resources um, to for everyone to live a a sufficient um, life of of well being, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that uh, we're only in the age of scarcity, in the sense that the distribution of resources, and so this is really why we followed in in um, Kate Rayworth's footsteps of talking about a regenerative and distributive economy. Because really, you know, mm -hmm. that that scarcity yeah. is is a human creation of scarcity for some and abundance for others instead of abundance for for all or sufficiency for all. I think that that's you know, that's that's an um, uh, sort of achieving sufficiency is is a better um, uh, goal necessarily than, than achieving abundance. So it's a recognition that generally speaking, the, the earth that we're living on, Gaia, if, if, you know, if you just look behind me, Gaia creates abundance. Um, and uh, so, so I think human use of, of resources, we for whatever reason have um, adopted systems that uh, actually um, both uh, overuse resources and distribute them in 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 unfair ways. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this this in terms of the work of R3.0, Ralph mentioned earlier that John Fullerton spoke at the 2015 uh, uh, conference, and that was the second conference that I was at. And and I think that it's fair to say that John made the most provocative point at that. And he said, you know, look, you guys at Reporting 3.0 are engaging with companies and investors from a leverage points um, uh, theory of change, that, that these are the biggest players. And so that's really the leverage point that, that you should be doing. Well, I, John Fullerton, want to introduce another leverage point, which is the bioregional leverage point. Nice. Um, and that really stuck with us. You know, it sort of took four more years of that sitting in the background, but it didn't go away. We definitely were, were tracking what was happening on the bioregional realm. And so in 2019, which was, I think, the second conference that you spoke at, Daniel, uh, uh, had you a, did a, a wonderful a, job of bringing it in with the Brabant region and then the little trip to like the region and development board being a partner. And yeah, no, I mean, you, you, you lived it with that conference. It was great. Well, and that was really the first, that was just by uh, happenstance that we were engaging with, a, with a region in, in the Netherlands. Um, and 
that at that time, uh, the, the Capital Institute, John Fullerton's uh, organization was launching the Regenerative Communities Network. And so, you know, after that conference, um, I decided to, to be a systems convener. That was the, the language that, that Capital Institute used for the bioregion that I live in, the Connecticut River Valley uh, in, mm -hmm. in um, Massachusetts and Connecticut and a little bit in Vermont. Uh, and so we we did launch that as a as a as a collaborative, and we've been doing work, uh, and really sort of applying uh, in a very preliminary way. We really haven't gotten off the ground at this point at all. But you know, how do you work within the regional limits and limits not seen as um, uh, a bummer? You know what I mean? Not not like mm. it's sort of like well, limits are just natural. They, well, they, they, yeah, I, I I love this notion that I I was I learned from one of my mentors Brian Goodwin at Schumacher College, who is mm -hmm. one of the founding fathers of complexity theory, and he I, I always felt it was an enormous gift also as a facilitator because you can when you try to get people to do an exercise and you give them the rules, they normally rebel against them, yeah? but this notion of enabling constraint is really powerful. Like, what are the enabling constraints for collective living as a regenerative species on this planet? Like, um, is, is much better than the rules that you must obey. Um, and because it helps us, it, it has the notion that by constraining in one way, we're actually enabling a system to be abundant for all or to actually feed at a higher level. Um, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, I've just been I, I just spoke at a, at a, the, a conference last week uh, and, and sort of noting that if, you know, uh, a, a work of art, a painting, you know, has a frame and the painter has to work within those constraints. And that's part of what makes it interesting. A, a, a jazz musician has notes and they have sounds on their their saxophone that they can mm -hmm. make. And, you know, we saw the pushing the limits of that. But there still are, you know, constraints, and and I do think that these constraints um, are 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 useful to us. That that they um, knowing what those biophysical constraints are and working within that, working in respect for that, um, is is a more mature way of doing things than than I'd say. You know, I'd say it's an adolescent part of ourselves to always want to. Um, uh, go beyond those those constraints or, or break the rules, if you will. Yeah, so, so just for the benefit of those listening, um, how would you sum up this notion of the need for a threshold and allocation council? And um, I know that you've already strategically started to map out what needs to be in place to actually make this system functional. And with your bioregional view, what would make it functional in this scale linking way? Mm -hmm. at the local, bioregional, and global scale. I'd, I'd love to just get a little summary of that. Well, uh, Ralph, do you want to maybe take the, 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 the council side of things and, uh, and I'll handle the network side of things? Sure, I can do that. And, 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 but I'm, I'm, of course, also triggered to respond. Um, I, think, I think the overlap between you and myself, Bill, uh, is 99.9 percent .9 because <laughs> I was I was sort of nodding most of the time. I think um, Fullerton's uh, contribution to R3.0 um, was really from from that 2015 conference onwards, and I think one of the first ways of, that we try to give it shape. Um, he was he was asking uh, a provocation at that conference, and 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 was saying. So what in a bio uh, what what in a in a regenerative context would be the unit of measurement? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, in the end, it is the it's the bioregion because this is where all influences come together, and you can create that frame and that boundary. And I think um, it has had a, a major effect on us earlier um, when we actually redesigned our approach where we look at things from various perspectives. So from the personal, the nano perspective, the organizational micro perspective, and then, and then we always called it the meso and the macro level. And the meso level, we really differentiated out um, also after that time where we said, well, it's not just industries 
<clears throat> or it is um, portfolios when you look at it from the financial markets perspective. It is also the regional aspect. Mm -hmm. So the different regions. Um, and so, so using the word scarcity really um, has to do for me with the fact that you, that that is language that corporations understand. It is language that, um, you know, as, as you were saying, you know, it is a bridge building mm. to that bioregional abundance. But, you know, when, when you're trying to uh, make a corporate aware of, uh, of certain resources that are left, you can call that scarcity if you want, um, like a greenhouse gas uh, or a carbon budget, uh, mm. where, you know, we're just in a conversation with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development or started the conversation where they were presenting their vision 2050 and, and I was responding, well, you know, the, the, uh, the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees is eaten up in the next six years. Mm. And you're talking Not about ready, yeah. But, but yeah. To, on, on that note, I, I would love to come in. I, I completely understand this and more on a meta level of how do we effectively use language and framing to um, leverage change. Um, that makes me sort of reflect on this wonderful sentence I, um, I just recently came across in the beginning of a documentary about um, Don Umberto Maturana. Maturana just died a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And at the beginning of that, um, I think it's a Maturana quote. The, the documentary almost opens up with the phrase, cultural change is generated by the feelings we, no, the, the culture and change happens through the feelings we generate with the con conversations we engage in. Mm -hmm. And that's quite powerful. And put next to that, Buckminster Fuller's, when you want to change the way people think, don't um, tell them what to think, give them a tool, the use of which will change the way they think. Well, language is such a tool. Wording, framing is such a tool. And when we bring in the framing that is so heavily loaded with kind of neo-Darwinian competitive um, survival of the fittest, scarcity, um, rise to the top, the, the strongest wins, the hard race of business. Or in that culture, it's, it's rife with degenerative um, means around scarcity and competition. That, that's why I, I'm, I'm always feeling like, can we, can we try to still pick people up there but, but really do so mindfully that when we, when we bring in words like that, we're actually still like, it's a tool that will create the way people think in terms of scarcity yeah. rather than abundance. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, think, of course. I mean, I think, I think this, is, this is the whole sort of central point that, that, um, that R3.0, I think the way that you framed it, Daniel, is that R3.0 is, is actually working um, in bridging the sort of the conventional world. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, Ralph's, uh, the, the, the story, the storyline that Ralph told um, of his own individual trajectory was from working within the system, you know, at a corporate, then at a, a standard setter, then at a, a, a you know, an, an auditing or assurance firm or, you know, when, and then finally going outside of that because the system really couldn't handle that kind of challenge from within. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the whole idea of positive mavericks that you started with, you know, that was a, a term that was coined by our, our colleague Raj Thamaratham with preventable surprises. And I'm, mm -hmm. a, a, in addition to being partners uh, organizationally, I'm a senior um, advisor to, to preventable surprises and really was engaging with them in depth when I was um, first came on board at, at R3.0. And mm -hmm. so this notion of a, of a positive maverick is, is somebody who is engaging in a positive way, but is recognizing the limitations of a current system, if you will. And, mm -hmm. and essentially they're saying, well, is that system operating in an ethical fashion? And if it isn't, then it's actually my ethical obligation to, um, to resist or to challenge that system. And I think that's the, the heart of what R3.0 is doing is that we're always trying to engage with the system on its own terms, mm -hmm. you know, in it, you know, using its own language and, and mm -hmm. you know, use, following the protocols of it. 
And at a certain point, you know, after you've made good faith efforts and the inside um, uh, uh, process isn't working, you kind of have to go to the outside. Well, this, but, but this is where I, I, Ralph, hear this. And this is where I pull my hat to you because you've, with everything you've done, you have all the, the chits in the game to play within the system at the highest level, become a partner at any of those big firms and rake in huge amounts of consultancy in the H2 minus space. Um, and, and the fact that you said, no, I'm sticking with integrity, I'm getting into this for a reason, and, and, and I'm going to step outside of that system, forego all the benefits that, that, that are in your reach, and, and build that bridge. That's really something um, that is a service to, to the movement. Um, thank you for that. Well, Chapeau. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, no, this is really, really from, from deep from my heart. And you could mm -hmm. read in the book more about that uh, and the motivations, especially that aspect of intergenerational equity. Uh, having, having two kids of myself um, mm -hmm. is just an immense um, calling, mm -hmm. so to say. And at a certain moment, what I'm also describing in the book, if you want to break through, you need to break out first. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm, I'm a, I wouldn't call myself a role model, but, I, but I've done it mm. <laughs> a couple of times, one time forced and uh, mm. two or three times really very purposeful. So from that perspective, you can, one can learn how to do that mm. and really look into the mirror and see Gaia uh, looking back mm. and asking yourself, just one simple question what have you done with the resources that i gave you mm. uh, have you been have you been sharing them in a fair and and good way have you overused them um all these very and, easy questions and the important thing there and which i think i think is whether the worldview and, and i'm sure the educational report is coming in that that you're now doing is um resources are so much more than what conventional economic theory sees it as resources which very often are too close to just material resources and then maybe resources, labor and so on and, and so forth. And um, it's, it's about qualities, it's ingenuity, creativity, relationships, um, health, yeah. um, vitality, resilience, that, 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 that's resourcefulness <laughs> in, 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 the, in the wider sense. Um, well, Daniel, I've, I've, I've written a whole chapter in the book about love. Yeah. Yeah, which is basically what it comes sums down it to. Up. Yeah. Which sums it up. And, um, but but what, what I'm wondering is, um, how do we build that bridge in communicating around this notion of co-creating abundance at the bioregional scale, but also, of course, within planetary limits? Um, the shift towards the bioregional, but but because we live in a culture where very quickly you can put, be pulled on one side or the other of the bridge, or people frame what is actually a dilemma to navigate, um, a hard and a soft value that both have a point that we just need to revisit as we navigate into the future, um, people frame it as an either or choice. Um, and And whether it's it's all about the global economy. No, it's all about the local, regional, re-regionalizing economies. And it's always the nuanced in between where we actually decide whether we're working regeneratively or not, whether we're working in alignment with life, where we're creating conditions conducive to life. So, mm -hmm. so how, um, like the work that James Quillican has done with, with the, the uh, San Francisco watershed. Like the, the, it's really important to look at what could we actually sustain in terms of amount of people with the water to just on, on an issue like food, water, energy, um, basic sovereignty of bioregional populations. And then there might be conversations around optimal population densities for a region like that. But, but how do we speak about the limits but keeping really the potential of what you were speaking to, Bill, of, of that there is actually enough to co-create abundance in almost in, in many places. And, and since there is global inequality and still the after effects of colonialization and then neo-colonialization through globalization, um, 
how do we at the same time as going regional stay global enough in the collaboration in different bioregions, enabling other people to do their bit in their region? Yeah, I mean, I think that you've hit on a lot of really important stuff, Daniel. And, um, you know, one of them is uh, earlier you said that, that we're really living in a culture that um, fetishizes uh, a, a, a neo-Darwinian uh, interpretation. So sort of survival of the fittest, individualism um, that really has been embraced by the capitalistic um, perspective and you know, a capitalistic perspective that uses colonization uh, as its, its primary tool uh, um, and, and extractivism, if you will. And so I think that, that you know, one of the things that, that we're constantly trying to do is um, to resist that, uh, that overarching um, narrative of, of that competition is the way to go. I mean, Ralph uh, often points out that, that we are consciously pre-competitive and market making. So we are, uh, we don't, we see that collaboration is the primary means of evolution. And I think that the evolutionary sciences back this up that, uh, you know, that we've done some work with David Sloan Wilson um, and, and the pro-social movement and, uh, you know, his, his multi-level selection theory is essentially saying that you know the traditional notion of natural selection is that you know individuals will will out uh, will compete with one another and and win that way at the individual or species level, and what what this other um, realm of of evolutionary theory says is actually well when you look at the evidence, uh, species and in particular the human species, uh, Homo sapiens, uh, a, 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 in particular ourselves uh, actually really had to collaborate radically in order to survive. So, so uh, although sort of um, competition at an individual level within a group uh, outperforms, uh, but in a group to group basis, it's groups of altruists, mm -hmm. groups of collaborators. And so that's sort of thinking that we're taking to heart and saying, how can we enact that as a kind of hack of our cultural priorities right now of competition, how can we use collaboration itself as a mm -hmm. as a as a, a, a as a culture uh, as a culture hacking activity? What I always find really helpful to add on to that David Sloan Wilson perspective is um, Elizabeth Sartorius has this notion of um, the the more long term maturation cycles in a single species evolution like some 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 species um as they stick around for longer because some species don't stick around for very long because they never make that jump uh, which is pre pretty much where we are at as human beings in the in the next level of the maturation cycle you realize as she puts it that it's cheaper to feed your enemy than to kill it kill them, that, you, that it's, it's better to build networks of collaboration and ecosystems where, like where you basically shift from a zero-sum win-lose game to a non-zero-sum game where, where you try that everybody um, wins in, in the system. And you understand that, which is a very regenerative notion, that the, the way to express your individuality is in service or support healing to the larger whole that then ultimately nourishes Mm -hmm. your, your life basis and 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 i think that the, the, the two go together they, I, I really appreciate um the pro-social work um it still has a little kind of classic darwinian touch to me um yeah i mean i i i think that um even so I, I don't always agree with every single uh, uh, field or school out there and there are aspects I've been um, engaging with pro-social, you know, asking the, the questions around, um, you know, the, 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 how does evolutionary biology deal with questions of equality, for example. And this even weighs in on the regenerative community. I mean, re regenerative community looks at living systems principles um, and and uh, the, the the science of living systems, but living systems actually use colonization 
uh, as a as a, a a mechanism. So is that something that we want to fully embrace? So I'm I'm you know actively asking myself the question: Do I embrace all living systems principles, do, which would include colonization as a living systems principle? Because that's living systems do that, and that's where I think that um, you know the idea of a of a of um, melding schools of thought together. So I would, I, I would embrace um, under a pro-social notion, both a living systems approach of regeneration and a, a decolonization approach. So it's just a, it's a living systems principle that I would choose to, 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 to not enact and use an alternative approach. It, again, I completely understand and honor where that's coming from. And then when I look at it from a framing perspective, it does perpetuate the, um, the nature culture dualism as like, and, and even when we, when we put a moral judgment on the colonialization or as, 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 a, as something that happens in natural systems. Um, the question is, does it, in what way, like mo most things, like most technologies we use, like it's, um, it's about how you use them. Um, does it create conditions conducive to life or does it not create conditions conducive to life for everybody involved? And the, the, the way that we could, as if we were outside of nature, choose to not fall into the pattern of, life creating conditions conducive to life is part of the, to my mind, part of that root um, organizing idea where, where we simply like the, it's like people who are social constructivists very quickly call you an eco-fascist when you bring in those ideas. But for me as a biologist and an ecologist, and of course that might be my bias, yeah, um, we are biological beings. Culture is an epiphenomenon of nature. Um, it's not a choice whether you have a metabolism or not, or whether you have a heartbeat or not, or whether some of the processes that actually maintain your health use the principle of colonialization of parts of your body in order right. to give you health. So, so that's, I'm just pointing that out as how quickly do we get into dangerous areas when we frame things um, in, in ways that still create that nature culture divide. Yeah, I mean, I think I would largely agree with what you're saying, Daniel. And so, um, uh, you know, I think colonization as it has been um, uh, enacted by human beings has, has not done the, you know, the, the work of um, taking the, the um, the well-being uh, or the, the 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 living of all, mm -hmm. and so you know that it may be that actually colonization, as practiced by human beings, is um, is is problematic. But I think you know to bring this to a, sort of a more tangible expression, I think that you know going back to to what you were saying about Maturana uh, and the whole notion of autopoiesis that he um, sort of co-created it calls for a boundary, like life requires a boundary in order to create itself. Otherwise, we've just got a big, um, a, a big mass of, uh, of, of stuff that's undifferentiated. So, so you know, boundaries, um, and this goes back to, I think our, our thresholds question, you know, so it's really a boundary is, first and foremost is what, is what defines life. And so I think that working within those boundaries, working within definitions creatively is, is, is what is necessary. And so bringing this back to your question about, you know, well, how do we, how do we enact these thresholds and allocations uh, in, in the real world? You know, one of the things that we're noticing is, or, or I guess it's a hypothesis that we're testing is can organizations that are um, committed to, to, to respecting these thresholds and allocations, you know, can they collaborate with one another? So can they be separate entities in a, in a sort of autopoetic sense while um, tapping into the evolutionary um, potential of, of collaboration? Or do they see 
uh, is there competition? You know, are, are, is it sort of the overriding um, capitalistic perspective of, well, you know, if, if, if we collaborate with that uh, uh, other organization, are they going to get funding that we don't get? You know, the, the, but, but the it's, it, it, NGO dilemma. <laughs> when, when I hear that question, I'm, I, my immediate sense is, um, well, that depends very much whether you're trying to build networks of organizations that operate globally, again, in that problematic and abstraction space, um, even if they have local manifestations where they're not abstract and very practical and, and embodied and, and doing stuff on the ground. And, and for me, that's, that, that, that is an ongoing question I have with the regenerative communities network, with even like the, the different communities of practice that are spinning out um, like a kind of fungal mycelium out of the, the activities from um, Regenesis group. Like there are now more and more cohorts of people who've gone through the regenerative practitioner training, building a field of people working with regeneration in, in that particular way. But there's, for me, there's always this tension, and I think you must have this as well in, in your life, both of you. Um, we need both and, again, it's not an either or, but um, where do we put our effort in building the global network, building that wonderful communities of positive maverage, uh, share our experiences, learn from each other, develop new ideas together, like you do with these um, blueprints and the, 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 the expert groups you put together in long co-creative processes, that are powerful because they also create human relationships between the people you invite. All wonderful work. And we need to work in the places we, we live in at the bioregional scale. And I think that when we engage in that focus, we still bump into the same knee-jerk responses of competition. But it's so much easier to put the, the bioregion and the place in the center, the culture, the shared context in the center and do Aikido with these initial competitive impulses and find how do we move on into a collaborative space in, 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 in that arena. And, and then like the whole weighing of, should we put 80% our attention into the global networking because that's what resources us and gives us funding and 20% into local Im implementation or should it not really be the other way around? That, that's a very personal question for me. Yeah. Me, me as well. I, I'm, I'm, I'm juggling the same uh, divide there, the same um, allocation <laughs> question with my own time, which is, you know, a, a, until we, we figure out, and hopefully we don't figure out how to escape time, because I guess that's another constraint that is part of what makes life interesting. Um, uh, although time travel could be could be interesting, I, I, I suppose. But anyway, you know, yeah, uh, you know, allocating, I, I'd say, I'm at maybe 30% of my time on bioregional or localized um, uh, efforts, uh, you know, serving on the board of, of co-op power, a regional uh, energy cooperative, uh, as an example of sort of an extension mm -hmm. of, of the R3.0 work at the bioregional level, and then continuing to engage globally. Um, and, and I think that this is something that sort of binds R3.0 is continually trying to engage uh, at the global level with the, the, the power brokers that, that we intersect with and doing it in a way where we're coming in with an alternate perspective that we believe we're not seeing anybody else come in with. So mm -hmm. we see a lot of players coming in with a sort of fairly standard um, approach of the field, an ESG, environmental social governance perspective and we're always sort of pushing that further to come with a, an alternative perspective, but, but ultimately wanting to have the solution be something that, that is collaborative, that we're not just breaking down systems, but rather we're, we're you know, using that notion of, of as systems are, are, are breaking down on their own, we're using them as compost for, for new systems to, to emerge from that. So, trying to avoid the, dis the, the creative destruction, do, do more creative than destruction, yeah. <laughs> if you will. And I, would, <laughs> and I would actually add, I think it is not sort of like um, acting with global players and they need to listen to you and then they are convinced. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's very seldom the case. Right. And <laughs> Never. <laughs> from that perspective, you know, we, we, we have relationships with major organizations um, for years until it actually comes into fruition and where the penny drops. Mm -hmm. And very often on a small scale first, and then it just meanders through the organization then, then, then again over the years. So there is no either or for me. Um, for me, it's, it's always both. Mm. Um, and, on, uh, and honestly speaking, yes, a part of our funding comes, comes from the more globalized organizations. Um, that's a, that's a, a necessary um, resource for us um, to do that work, but not in a com competitive way, <clears throat> but being pre-competitive in market making. And then at the same time, um, supporting that, that bottom-up movement, mm. um, just to let it sort of come into fruition into our community, let it be explained at our conferences, work it into our workshop materials, into our transformation journeys, where again, people from the corporate side come in and, and hear and learn. So it's a, it's, a, it's a process that, like our journey, takes these organizations uh, many, many years as well. And some um, will engage and others will fall off. Mm. Um, we've seen both happening. Um, and I think, I think the, the other thing that really connects both the sort of more globalized organizations and the sort of bottom-up movements is first of all, the question, will these globalized organizations have a chance to survive at all? A question that they don't ask themselves, mm. not even at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. They always think they, they can continue, you know, as, mm. a, as a 200 global, uh, global players. I'm questioning that. Uh, yeah. I asked that question. I don't. I don't get a response uh, to that question. Well, actually, I, I, it, it hasn't I, even started. Just to just to finish this idea, and then and then uh, at the same time, um, there is this idea of governance and the idea of weaving, where what comes up from the bottom sort of multiplies through weaving into other spheres. And at a certain moment, uh, the global companies will realize that they are actually active in many of these bioregions. Mm. Uh, and their approaches will need to change over time. Mm. Um, and there's then not this sort of one size fits all globalized logistical process of um, you know, shooting your products to uh, everywhere around the world. Mm. That might stop at a certain moment. It, a certain in, in, in my experience, um, just briefly to add this to, to, to what you just opened up. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with large corporates wanting to move towards as a regenerative path. Uh, and for me, it's always a question of integrity that I only, like I, I would work with most companies, but, but only speaking truth to power in the sense of like, I'm, I'm not going to fall into what I hear too many consultants say, which is, this is as far as we can take our clients, we can't say that. Uh, um, if I ever hear myself think that, I will say that in order to stay in integrity. Um, and, and yeah, of course, that means that with some large corporate clients, I've only had one conversation for some surprise. Um, <laughs> they didn't invite me back. But, but actually what's surprising me is, is how actually very large companies are also beginning to understand that that, you, it really touched me when you were sharing that that incredible role that you were given by Medicine Sans Frontier at the beginning of this conversation when you shared your, your story of what you can do is hold this human being in their arms on their last journey. That's a, that's a tough thing to do. And I find that somehow with some of these large corporates, like if we don't bring mortality and collapse, breakdown, dissolution, complete dissolution of, of structure. We're not talking about transformation. Part mm -hmm. of transformation is complete dissolution of structure. Oh, absolutely. And, and for, for these large corporates, I personally believe the only way through the eye of the needle of for the, the potential in the human being and the knowledge network they've created sometimes over a century eh, of relationships with place, um, is to become a global network of local or bioregional enterprises and to basically hospice their own megalith, monolith out of existence while they midwife the, the network of diverse 
regional players into existence. And yeah, that's exactly the notion that we want to bring in through the discourses that we have with them. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I'm, I'm very conscious of time. And there's two things that we, I, I think we should not give it more than another 10 minutes maximum. So the, the recording doesn't get too long. But um, two things that I would like to talk about. I mean, we need to briefly talk about your book. We'll leave that to last. Uh, and, but, but the one thing that, that I also would love your take on, because it's something that I, I say a lot, and then I don't really spend enough time really teasing into it. Um, another caveat, on the one hand, yes, it builds in a wonderful bridge to talk about five capitals, to, to open beyond the financial capital only type discourse. Um, or economic capital, not financial capital. Um, but how do we, in trying to be of help through valuing other aspects, social capital, natural capital, built capital, and so on, not also open up the danger of either our own peers or somebody else once this, this structure is in place, finding a very nice formula that converts financial capital into ecological capital or natural capital. And just with that one formula of translation um, or exchange, you, you're basically complicit in a, in a kind of enclosure of the last commons that, that are still out there. The, 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 the subtlety of relationship between people in community, the subtlety of relationship to place and so on. Um, how, how do we, like, I'm, I'm, I'm aligned that we need a multi-capital approach, but how do we name that elephant in the room and how do we safeguard against that potential caveat? Maybe I'll, I'll take that one since I'm probably not gonna speak as much on the book, although I'll, 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 uh, I'll definitely uh, uh, give the thumbs up for it. Um, but on the capitals, and, and also I had been the, the author of the multi-capitalism um, white paper that, that R3.0 just, just published. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the term capital is conflicted because it has such a long history of just being about a mono capital. So just being about finance and finance having, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, exerting its influence beyond other resources. So, you know, one solution is just to not use the term capital and use the term resources. But, but I find that that is, is kind of a, a, a cop-out, you know, that, yeah. that, that linguistically we're using a marker that has problems with it and we can either engage with that, uh, with, with those challenges um, or we can try to sidestep them. And I think there's as much of a danger in that sidestepping that we don't actually confront the core um, uh, challenges. So I'm, you know, while I'm, I'm uncomfortable with, with mono-capitalism or financial uh, capitalism as it's practiced right now, um, I, you know, multi-capitalism also has potential pitfalls as, as mm. you're saying. Um, I think that there are two, two ways that come to mind immediately for addressing what you're talking about. One is that, um, you know, capitals, a resource, a social capital, a natural capital, you know, one thing that you can do with it is you can monetize it or you can place a financial value on a capital. And um, one of the things that multi-capitalism calls for is saying, well, yeah, you can do that. And there are ways that you can do that that are that, you know, avoid problems. But it also means that there may be, and, and well, in fact, there is, there's always going to be a, a stock or a body of that resource that you just simply can't monetize, that it is, it's it it needs to be um, set aside, or, or you know, some um, uh, academics from Oxford call this critical capital. So this is capital that you actually take out of the, the marketplace, if you will. And so that in some ways goes contrary to the whole idea of, of monetizing because the idea of monetizing is that it's, it's fungible, it's tradable. It's, it's something that you can move around and um, express its value through something besides itself. Mm -hmm. And so 
I think multi-capitalism as, as we've conceived of it, um, working, working with uh, Mark McElroy, the original conceiver of that concept, you know, it would say that not all capital can be put on, into the marketplace. Um, and, and also I think that not everything can be expressed as capital. You know, mm -hmm. there, there, there's good. folks like, you know, Gregory Landway, uh, uh, I think originally expressed eight or maybe 10 capitals. Yeah, with spiritual uh, capital and also spiritual yeah. capital in that, yeah. That's something that I, I, can, I can understand that and I can actually sort of wrap my head around that, but I typically don't speak in terms of spiritual capital because mm. it isn't something that I'm looking at as um, uh, it, it, it sort of, it operates on a whole different market level, if you will, or <laughs> an exchange yeah. or a, you know, I, 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 and so I actually don't use that. And in fact, Dana Meadows, when she was articulating the, the daily triangle uh, after Herman Daly, didn't put a capital with the ultimate ends of, of well-being and transcendence and et cetera. So, so I mm -hmm. think there, it, there are ways that you can engage with sort of resources, if you will, and, and not label them capitals as, as a means of saying, you know, these, these aren't fungible. These aren't things that, that sort of um, uh, can be traded in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. It, you mentioned the, the report that came up. Maybe one more question to you, Bill, and then, then a quick conversation about the book. Um, wh where do people find out more? Where do they do download, um, for example, that, that uh, report you just mentioned? And, um, and also there's a new conference coming up. Maybe you just can open up a window to that. Sure. So just quickly, the, um, the, 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 the white paper on multi-capitalism, we actually just launched a new part of our website, um, which has white papers, opinion papers, and case studies. And so, you know, that multi-capitalism white paper is, is both in the, um, that part of our website that's devoted to, to positive maverick thinking. So that's the, the sort of the navigation bar, and then white papers are a part of that. And then it's also covered in our uh, research uh, section. We have sort of research and test labs under our solutions um, um, tab. Mm -hmm. And so that whole project that, that you know, started out collaborating with the International Integrated Reporting Council and, and then ultimately ended up with just us publishing it is, is covered in the research uh, mm -hmm. section. Um, and, and that's and R3 hyphen, r3-o.org, is it? Right, r3-0.org, r3 dot, dot, dot yeah. yeah. exactly. And, and the conference is, 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 is coming up and we will have one of the, the tracks, if you will, will be around multi-capitalism uh, at the conference. And, and we have, um, uh, right now we've got, uh, uh, Delphine Gibassier from Audencia Business School, um, Mark McElroy, who's the conceiver of the concept of multi-capitalism, um, Tiered Krumpelman from ABN AMRO, uh, and Catherine Trebek uh, from the, the We All uh, Wellbeing Alliance, uh, Wellbeing Economy Alliance, uh, speaking in, in, in that uh, section. But people can go to, uh, to, can link to the conference uh, website from our main website. Excellent. And another way of finding out a lot more about the work that you've done together is to read um, Ralph's new book that just came out, um, in which you also introduce a lot of the, like you re reflect on um, the, the opportunity, the potential within the corona crisis of actually building back differently and building the new rather than trying to bounce back to an old that was dysfunctional in the first place. Um, so uh, yeah, tell us a little bit more about your book and where people can get it. Yeah, well, the, the book is not sort of a copy paste from all of the documents that R3.0 has written so far. Mm -hmm. It was really the idea that came up uh, in the early days of the Corona um, crisis, just simply thinking about what happens if I, if I am becoming a victim of this. What is it that I leave behind? What are my essential thoughts? What do I stand for? And that went into some, some sort of meditation uh, on my early morning walks with, uh, with our dog Mila. Mm -hmm. um, so, so half an hour where I was just thinking, what are these essentials? What are you, what do you stand for? And so I, I try to really very um, candidly try to put that into very crisp quotes, like mm -hmm. two to three sentences. And then another strange or, or, or maybe <laughs> karma thing happened. I had a, a folder on my cell phone 
um, with pictures that I shot with that with the same cell phone um, and put that into a special folder because I thought, well, these are pictures that I want to use at a certain point. And when I came up with the first quotes, some of these pictures came 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 back and uh, I wanted to be connected to um, to the quotes. Mm -hmm. So each sub chapter really starts with a picture and a quote. Um, and which are somehow connected. And there was not the idea that that would end up in a book, but more and more people were, were asking me if I can um, collect that into a booklet. And then another th thought that, that came up was that, that when I asked myself, why did you come up with that quote? There was always a backstory to these quotes. Mm -hmm. So I started to write up these, these, um, these backstories as well. And that went rather smooth, I have to say. So writing that, that that book was not a huge burden, so to say, because mm -hmm. I knew what what I would tell um, in connection to these quotes and the and the pictures. Um, I, mean, I must say, it, it makes it easy to read, like it just sort of um, having a lot of like the eye doesn't face pages and pages of black on white. Yes, um, it, there's the quotes, and it's it's a it's a very easy read. Uh, yeah well that. And, and that was the other thing i i just didn't want to write a, a, a technical expert book for the community that we're mm. in but knowing that everybody on this planet was or is somehow influenced by covid uh, and there is so much to learn from from these last one and a half years i wanted to have it written in a way that it is more for a broader public mm -hmm. so that um, it really reaches people that were for the very first time in their life think about what what um, a carrying capacity is or what a uh, what allocations mean or what um, um, yeah another example is that whole idea of flatten the curve mm -hmm. uh, that i'm describing in the book you know that corona is a perfect example of um, explaining what a threshold is mm -hmm. healthcare capacity is a threshold and how do you allocate the resources um, in in a way that 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 all of these people can be helped uh, and hopefully cured? Not all of them, of course, but um, this idea of flatten the curve when it when it came up sort of broadened into with all the other crises that we still have in front of us: the resource crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and if we're not solving all of the the human extinction crisis they all have that ingredient of needing to flatten the curve. So mm -hmm. that idea of flattening the curve has to be applied to more or less everything if mm -hmm. we want to come up to a regenerative and distributive economy. And don't get me into scarcity again, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, but this, this, yeah, that's, 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 that's how it all came together. And I think um, the only other thing that I needed to, to do is to think about, you know, lo looking at that whole spectrum of these quotes and the backstories and how would I structure that into a way um, that the book has sort of a logic thread um, and and I think I succeeded quite well in that so and then I had a publisher that came to me that said you know I've I've, I've heard about the book project and honestly speaking I have this I have this series of books which I call modern visions mm -hmm. and um, you know I want to publish this book lovely and that is how a very nice relationship developed and where he was very helpful and, and really putting a lot of effort in the design of the book as well, which mm -hmm. I think is quite beneficial to the, to the whole thing. Mm, absolutely. No, it's a, it's, it's a lovely book and it's really readable and it, it really, um, I mean, people say, say that about a lot of books, it's food for thought, but this is really food for some very important thought that m many people should engage in to um, question what does coming back to normal mean and how, how could we um, create a world that would actually be beneficial for, for so many more people than the world before Corona was? Yeah, well, um, the, 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 the message of hope of the book is that a new normal is possible mm. and that um, think twice if you ask back the old normal mm. because think, it, is, it is going to kill us. It, 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 it reminds me, I, I just love that, um, to, just to bring Nora Bateson in as a way of closing. Um, I loved the way at the end of the 2019 conference, when she asked that question of how much of all this conversation about transformative um, change uh, will give us 
caterpillars with wings rather than butterflies. And, exactly. and really that nuanced conversation about what does transformation really mean and not mm -hmm. just bolting on a few new concepts and so on is, is really at the heart of it. And, and it, and it requires that we all stay in the room and it requires that we engage people <clears throat> who still might have a longer way across the bridge um, from either end. And, and that's why I so deeply appreciate the community you've curated and, and, and you're holding the space you, you're bringing um, both with business and it's not just the business world, it's the finance world. Now you're moving into education. Those work with the United Nations is, is, is seeding these, these ideas in a UN context, um, all of that is, is really wonderfully um, culturally transformative work and part of the regeneration rising. So deep appreciations. And yeah, thank positive you. mavericks need to unite. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Daniel. Bye-bye.